Hey, everybody. How we doing? Doing good. I'm sorry I kind of missed the first part. Uh, this morning? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, this is life. Stuff happens. Yeah. But that's okay. You doing all right? Yeah. In general, yes. Thank In general, you. you guess? Okay. Well, if there's anything you need me to go back over, I'll be happy to repeat it or whatever. I want to ask you a question later or maybe Friday. Okay. About pencils. About what? Pencils. Okay. Well, why don't you go ahead and ask me now? Well, I went to the store and I saw a uh, shackle pencil and uh, acrylic pencil and shot. But I know in class we use shot. But about the charcoal pencil and acrylic, when when I should use those? Uh, now there's graphite, and then there's charcoal. Uh huh. I've never heard of an acrylic pencil. No, that graphite. I'm sorry. Yeah, that one. Okay. Yes. All right. But say, wait a minute. I've never heard of an acrylic pencil. But anyway. Um, when should you use those? Well, my recommendation is this. If you're drawing on a loose piece of paper that you're not gonna put in a book or a portfolio where it's gonna rub against other things, charcoal and like Castel chalk, stuff like that, it's fine, okay? You don't need to worry about it. If though, you're drawing in a sketchbook my recommendation is that you don't use that because if you do, it's going to end up on the back side of the page, right? Uh -huh. So my recommendation is that you use something that doesn't rub off or smear. And for that, I use stuff like this, okay? And this is a Prismacolor pencil, okay? So it's basically a colored pencil. Uh, you can get them in black brown, different shades of gray if you want. They probably have almost 800 different colors or more, you know, in these principal colored pencils. <clears throat> and I'll go down and I buy the sepia color, which is kind of a, it's kind of a cooler brown color. It's kind of dark. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very neutral. It's almost like a raw umber. And uh, that's generally what I draw in a sketchbook with. Uh, the other thing I'll use in a sketchbook is uh, just a ballpoint pen. Again, you know, because, you know, I've got just a regular ballpoint pen, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reason I use this is, again, once you put it down, it dries, it's permanent, and it's not going to go anywhere, okay? Yeah. Now... You can buy these like fine line art pens that you can use in a sketchbook as well. Uh, depending on the brand that you get, some of those work really well. Uh, and, it, and it depends on, on the paper and the pen working together. Uh, because some of those pens on some paper will show through the backside. Others will sit on the top real nice and won't be a problem. Okay, so you won't see your drawing through uh, or come through on the other side. Uh, but some of those, um, when you sketch with it, you can only really sketch on one side because the back side of the page, it's, it's soaked through and showed up on the back, okay? All right, so those, thank those, you. Yeah, those are the things you want to kind of think about while you're sketching and drawing. Um, you know, try to use the, the most effective tool you can uh, and for just keeping your drawings intact. Again, you know, if you're drawing on loose sheets of paper, like uh, newsprint or some kind of drawing paper, then charcoal, uh, pastels, things like that, those are fine. Okay? But if you're gonna put it in a sketchbook, then I would use something that's not going to rub off. And that's the key consideration there, all right? All right, thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any questions about stuff like that while we're on that subject? No. Here. 
You're all so quiet. What's wrong it's with Monday. this group? Okay. It's Monday. It's Monday. It's Monday. You're not awake yet, huh? <laughs> Wait a minute. It's Monday afternoon. Are we, uh, maybe we're muted. Did you unmute us? Uh, there's there's a lot of you have muted, but hey, um, you know you all have those little buttons you can push if you want to. All right. Anyway, I want to get started. Okay, and uh, we're going to kind of pick up where we left off. I've got a couple more artists to cover, and um, you know, and I wanted to show you. Um, Remember this morning, we looked at a sculpture, and it was of David, right? Right. Uh -huh. Several. And I was talking about the David that Donatello, another artist, had done about 50 years before this one. Okay? And so I'm going to show that to you. And this is it, right here. Yeah. Okay. Now, what do you notice about this? bronze statue and oh by the way this statue it's probably about four or five feet tall it's not quite i don't think it's quite life-size okay but it's he not that hat on. he has a hat on he has yeah. a helmet on yes okay. he also the other one had a a head at the base of his feet and this does head. too that doesn't look Got like a head. head it's a head in a helmet it's Goliath. And Goliath, also, yes. From ED. Yeah, also notice that with this one, there's a, it's like a laurel or a wreath. Wreath, yes. Yeah, that the, you know, that they're standing on, right? And right. David's got his, his sword at his side. But what do you notice about the figure of David? More uh, the face looks feminine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very much so kind of a very almost effeminate, you know, feel to this male yeah. figure, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I mean, he doesn't look particularly threatening, does he? Yep. He's not as muscular looking as the other one. I mean, that's, that's I think, the reason for that. No, no, he's, yeah, he's very soft looking. You know, it's almost like a female figure, right? Right. Okay. Because he was only a kid when he uh, slew Goliath. Right, yeah, he was supposed to be a young boy, you know, probably, you know, like a a, in time, puberty, though. you know, 13, 14, something like that, okay? Uh, so, yeah, he wasn't this, this grown warrior or, or man, all right? But again, you know, Donatello's interpretation was this very soft kind of almost... I think he had a knife in his hand, though, instead of a sword, though, did he not? Uh, no, no, they both had swords. They did have a sword? Yeah, okay. I'll show you the other one here. Got it now myself. Okay. Yeah. Now here's mm -hmm. another uh, here's another sculpture by Donatello. Okay. And you're gonna see this very same story played out later on by with an artist uh, by the name of uh, Carvaggio. And actually there was uh, one of the women, Artemisa. Uh, she also did a painting about this very same story, and that was uh, Judith and uh, what was his name? Yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, she beheads him, and uh, you know, a lot of nice stuff going on back then, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but as the story goes, you know, uh, he kind of deserved it because he, he deflowered her, so, and that was kind of, you know, not a nice thing to do, so, uh, so yeah, she, she took her vengeance on him and cut off the head off, but, uh, but you'll see uh, two of the artists, like I said, Artemisa, who I had sent you, uh, did a painting, and it's probably one of the more relevant uh, paintings from the Renaissance period that a woman artist did. And then uh, Caravaggio uh, did a painting of this very same thing. Uh, obvious, <clears throat> obviously, it's a very different interpretation. But anyway, so that's Donatello, just to kind of refresh the memory of it. And then... Uh, We're getting lots of people now. We got like 23 folks on here now. 
Uh, well, with our seating arrangement, we could have a 50 even. We could have a what? I said with our seating arrangement, we could have 50 people join in. Well, you know, that's true too. We, we probably could. Uh, wait a minute here. I got to get something out of the way so I can... I lost my, uh, evidently I closed something I shouldn't have closed. <laughs> Lucky me, right? Yeah. Let's try this again. Uh, there we go. Yay, we're back. Okay, so now we can. Uh, okay, let's stop sharing that and go back and share the right thing. There we go. That's what we want. Okay, so we're back to where we kind of left off this morning. And this... Well, that was the first piece this morning, yeah. 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 See, is that this a sword or a knife in his hand? It's a sword. Okay. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's a sword. sword. And, yeah. and you have know, the head. Yes. You, be, you know, same outcome to the story. You know, he still, you know, beheads Goliath. Right. But again, you see, uh, this figure looks a little more masculine. Right. You know, probably, you know, probably similar age, maybe a little bit older, but certainly, you know, a little more muscular. Right. So again, you know, the, the view of it, the interpretation of it, you know, changed depending on the artist and, and who, who was doing it. So I wanted to go back and I wanted to show you those so that you, you can see the differences between the two. Um, and we kind of left off with uh, Leonardo. And uh, everybody knows this, right? right? Anybody not recognize this painting? Okay, so this is the Mona Lisa. And uh, probably one of the most famous paintings in all of the world. If, if you don't know much about art, <clears throat> you know, most people still know, you know, this painting, you know, at first sight. Now, again, you know, why is this painting really all that important, right? And why do people make the fuss out of it that they do? Because it certainly wasn't the first portrait of a woman that was ever painted that was not of nobility or royalty or anything like that. Uh, it certainly had nothing to do with a biblical theme, right? Right. So, so why is it really that important? Anybody have any ideas? A mysterious look. Well, yeah. that mysterious yeah. little look. It was, uh, it was a smile and also because of the background, the, the, the uh, perspective that he used in the, uh -huh. yeah. in the background, but it, it was always the smile that, that, that attracted people to, to, to this uh, portrait. Right. Well, actually, this, this was kind of the painting that set Leonardo da Vinci up and above his mentor, okay? And uh, Leonardo had gone out and he had opened up his own studio. He had left, you know, the master that he was working with, right? And he produced this painting and uh, almost immediately, uh, you know, anybody who saw this painting pretty much so clearly knew that he you know, he was not only equal to his master, he had gone far beyond what he had been, you know, trained to do. And because this one particular painting, for example, okay, uh, as I said, Leonardo uh, developed this concept or this idea of what we call atmospheric perspective, right? The other name for that is, in Italian, is sfumato. See, I can say it this afternoon, and I've had enough coffee now. Uh, <laughs> but, but really what that boils down to is atmospheric perspective, right? And so, you know, when you look off in the distance, 
right? Let's say that you're painting a hill that's far away or a mountain or something like that. Um, and, and, you know, you see this mountain and it's kind of a blue color. Why do you think it's blue? Because of the distance. Yeah, but what, it, what is it about? Yeah, we know it's far away, but if you went over to that mountain, would it actually be blue when you got there? No. No. No, it's going to have green trees and rocks and, you know, it would just look like any other mountain, wouldn't it? But when you're 10 miles away, it turns this blue color. Do you know why? The atmosphere changes it. Yes, but how? The color of the sky is, is uh, reflected on it somehow. Yeah, somewhat. Okay. Anybody else got any ideas? Come on, you guys got your thinking caps on today? Well, one, one thing that might be is, is the fact that the, the, the atmosphere is full of junk uh -huh. and light re reflects through that in various mystery ways and grayish, bluish is one of those colors that kind of works its way out to you. Okay, you're you're getting close. Okay, so here's and but you're 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 very close. Okay, here's the thing, and and you're all kind of right. You, you kind of got the right idea. All right. When we think about air around us, all right, we look at it and we think it's clear. You know, we don't think it has a color, right? But the fact is that the air close to you and far away and across the whole planet is full of all kinds of junk, right? You know, there's water vapor, there's dust particles, there, you know, these days there's, you know, heavy metals and pollutants and Oxygen stuff. And everything else, yeah. Okay, right. And in fact, at certain times of day, like early in the morning, and particularly just before sunset, you know, this, the angle of the sun gets so low and the light coming through the atmosphere begins to refract and you get all this color, right? These bright reds and oranges and, you know, it's really beautiful. But the only reason that happens is the air is not transparent, okay? And that light, as it goes through the atmosphere, depending on how much humidity and, you know, general, you know, pollution is in it, begins to actually bend or refract that light. And that's why you get color. Well, the same thing is true when you're looking off in the distance. You know, you're, you're not really looking through something that's clear. You're looking through something that's got lots of this material floating around in it, and it has an effect, and it diffuses the color, and the light refracts through it. And so as things get further away, they tend to get sometimes purple, sometimes blue. Again, it depends on the time of the day, the angle of the sun, and, and how much pollution is in the air. You know, if you've uh, ever been up to the North Georgia mountains or anywhere, and you look off in the distance, you know, some days you can see that mountain very clearly, and it looks green or whatever. You know, you come back a few days later, and it's this purplish color, right? What changed? Well the atmosphere changed, right? Maybe the time of day changed, maybe the angle of the sun changed. Uh, but those little, you know, changes in the atmosphere make a huge difference. And <coughs> da Vinci was one of the people who, you know, observed things like that and started actually incorporating it into his paintings. And up until that time, if you look at everything before him, most artists, you know, uh, there's not really a, an artist on record that shows any sense of what we call atmospheric perspective. So da Vinci, you know, was important in that sense of making that kind of observation and being able to capture it in paint. And the other thing that he was able to do was he was able to capture this sense of light. And that's what I call hero, right? Now, chiaroscuro to him was not a new idea. It's just that he mastered it and went far beyond 
what any of the other Renaissance artists had done up until that time. And, uh, and that's why you get this very naturalistic, very soft look to this woman. And look at the form on her, the form of her hand. You know, it doesn't feel like it's a flat canvas. It feels like it's a firm yeah. surface, right? Her fingers feel like they're round and that they're just slightly bent and that they're moving around her wrist. Uh, the same thing with her face. You know, it seems to sit and all those planes seem to work together very nicely, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why he was really critically important as an artist, okay? Now he did a lot of different stuff. He was not just a painter, right, by any means. Um, and then of course we have this guy. You know, nobody knows anything about him, right? This is uh, Michelangelo. Oh. And this is the, um, the back wall or the altar area of the Sistine Chapel, right? And uh, this is generally referred to as the last. Uh, and that's what it is. It's, it's about, you know, it's that Renaissance idea of when you die, you go to heaven or do you go to hell? So you, know, you go up and you're judged and, you know, and then they decide, you know, where you're going to be spending the rest of eternity. Um, you know, the folks down here are not having a good time. The folks up here, you know, they're having a, a little bit better time. Well, you know, as you get up here. Um, <laughs> you know, but it was a very strong visual message. Now, obviously... You know, this was a commission for the Catholic Church, and uh, you know that being said, you know he he was telling the story that you know they wanted him to tell. Right? Uh, this is another section of the Sistine Chapel, and most people are familiar. With this. Um, if they're not familiar with the whole chapel itself, they're familiar with this part. And it, the idea is that, you know, God is uh, giving the spark of life to Adam. So, now this was painted, uh, this was painted in a technique called fresco, all right? And somebody asked this morning what fresco was. That uh, was Bernice, that was Bernice. <laughs> okay, does anybody remember what fresco is? Yes, Charles. Plaster with the coloring in it. Right. Yeah. But they put plaster down first. So yeah, the plaster has to be wet. See, so you've got, to wet, you've got to actually work on this wet plaster surface. If the plaster dries, then the paint won't seep into it and it won't become permanent, right? So it's, you know, you can't do like a huge section. You've got to do small sections at a time. And you just put down enough plaster for you to paint, you know, in that given amount of time. Now keep in mind that when these were painted, you couldn't go to the art store and pick up a brush, you couldn't pick up a tube of paint. There were no such things, right? Um, every day when an artist needed to work, what would happen is, get up early in the morning and you would have to start making your color that you were going to use. And then once you made your color, then you could start applying the plaster to the wall and then transferring what they call the cartoon. And as soon as the cartoon was transferred, then you could actually start painting. Uh, so there was a process to it. Now, most people are under the uh, misconception that Michelangelo actually painted this. Okay. And the fact is, he did not. Okay. Hmm. What, what Michelangelo did, in fact, was he did the drawings and he did the concept for all of the artwork within the Sistine Chapel. Did he actually paint any of it? Well, if he ever did, it was very, very little. Because the thing about Michelangelo was he was really not a painter. Sculpture. No, he was a sculptor. Well, he was mainly a sculptor and he was an architect. 
okay? Uh, and those, those were his strong suits. But he ran a studio with over 100 artists in that studio. And amongst those 100 artists were, you know, people who worked in gold and metal, uh, people who were other sculptors and carved in wood or stone, things like that. There were painters who painted in oil or tempera. And there were artists who specialized in this technique called fresco. And he had a whole lot of people that he hired basically to work for him to do this work, okay? Now, um, you might remember, we talked about an, an artist by the name of uh, Giberte, right? Who was an architect, okay? Remember that was like last week? And Giberte um, had a group of artists that he favored. And Michelangelo was not one of them, okay? And in fact, uh, he, he was kind of in direct competition with Michelangelo. And in fact, uh, as rumor goes, he actually put out a contract to have Michelangelo killed uh, because Michelangelo was beginning to take favor away from him and his stable of artists. And it was very competitive back then. And uh, anyway, so he, he, for whatever reason, he couldn't kill him off. And, and I think he tried several times. Uh, so what he ended up doing was uh, he had the ear of the Pope and the, the Pope had this project that, you know, there was a new chapel being built. It was called the Sistine Chapel and it needed to be decorated. And, you know, Gaberte thought to himself that the, you know, the best thing he could do was he could promote Michelangelo to do the, the frescoes and the de decoration, you know, in the Sistine Chapel, knowing that that was not Michelangelo's strong suit. And the idea was that once Michelangelo kind of fell on his face and wasn't able to do it, Gaberte could come in and come to the rescue and rescue the project with his artist. And basically, you know, Michelangelo would never work for the church again. Well, unfortunately for Gaberte, it didn't work out so well. Uh, you know, he, he pulled it off and not only did he pull it off, uh, he won favor with the Pope. And after that, uh, Gaberte's reputation and career, you know, basically declined for the rest of his life. And he was fairly old at that time, um, but he had, he had a, a rather large stable of young artists that uh, were ready in the wings to step up and take his place. And uh, unfortunately it just didn't work out. So, so that's why we have that story called the agony and the ecstasy, right? Everybody familiar with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that was supposedly the story of Michelangelo's struggles in, in doing this. Of course, Hollywood got a hold of it, they dramatized it, and, you know, they had Michelangelo painting the whole Sistine Chapel all by himself. <laughs> Never happened, okay? So, so much for Hollywood. But, uh, you know, reality is, uh, it, it still was not easy, okay? It, it was a, uh, a major feat, regardless, okay? So... I found this little piece. Uh, this is a painting by another artist of that period. And uh, his name is Raphael. Now you'll notice that this painting has lots of circles and lines and all kinds of things going on, right? Mm -hmm. And what it's talking about, or the article that I got this from, was really about the underlying geometry of a lot of these Renaissance paintings. Uh, if you study art you know, for any length of time, you know, we, we talk about composition. And composition was, you know, a key factor 
uh, somebody needs to meet themselves. Um, at any rate, composition was a key factor in just about every restaurant. And um, as a matter of fact, you know, it was all. And very, very secretive about how they arrange their paintings. And so uh, this is a, an underlying composition of one of Raphael's paintings. And you'll notice, you know, the uh, series of circles that are based on this center line running through the actual painting. And, uh, uh, you know, each of these are dead in the center of the paint, it would be really kind of a bright point. So, yeah, yeah, probably about this X right here. Right here. But when you look at it, you know, this is the focal point. And then what happens? You know, you kind of go to this guy's hand, you come down, and then back up to this guy, right? And then oh, oh, oh that, that, it's right. junk anyway. Is that, yeah. okay, sorry. So yeah. you know, figures, right? And then back and forth through the painting. Uh, whoever's playing. With you, so we can hear you. Okay. okay, I think they got it. Okay. Uh, all right, so the key thing here is to kind of set up a movement or a flow, you know, back through the painting, keep your eye circulating, you know, so that you never really get to a point where you leave the painting, but you just keep moving, you know, through it. And so this is just a you know, the underlying geometry to this particular painting by Raphael. And it's called the uh, Transfiguration, right? Now, obviously that painting does not have all of those lines on it. Um, but when you start looking at Renaissance paintings, one of the things that you want to start to begin to try to understand is that there, there is a geometry you know, an underlying geometric pattern that was set up, you know, to design these paintings. And they, they relied heavily, you know, on that geometry and believed in it, you know, part of it. You know, today, when a lot of artists are composing a painting, you know, very seldom will they take the time to set up an underlying geometric grid and then design their painting over that. But these guys did, you know, and that was, that was a key thing for them. Uh, again, you know, this is another uh, Raphael. This is called the uh, Sistine Madonna. And again, this is a fresco uh, that was at, uh, at the Sistine Chapel. Uh, not in the main part of the chapel, but also in one of the rooms, I think. This is another one of his pieces. And Raphael was probably, you know, one of the Okay. All right, Equal, don't don't forget your blue don't forget your blueberries. Pardon me? Oh yeah. Um here. I'll I'll tell you what, I'll keep care of this. We only have five minutes left. I'm going to mute everybody. Uh, okay. All right. So go back to this. Okay. Uh, as I was saying, you know, he and Titian, uh, Da Vinci, uh, Caravaggio, they were all probably the uh, probably the most dynamic, interesting artist of, of that period of time within that 300 year period. And Raphael, when you look at his work, um, you know, has some really incredible and really, really complicated paintings. You know, if, if you were trying to paint this, first of all, it's a large painting, but look at the number of figures. 
uh, look at the perspective, look at the architecture. You know, there's a lot there, you know, to, uh, to have to handle. So, you know, he, you know, he, he knew his stuff really well. You know, of course, you, you couldn't go through the day and not mention Botticelli. And this is the birth of Venus. Okay. And we had seen one of his works earlier. Um, again, you know, very, very strong figurative artist. Uh, when you look at the use of the landscape here, you know, it's not nearly as sophisticated as uh, Da Vinci's, you know, with the atmospheric, you know, perspective, things like that. Yeah. Still, you know, a beautiful piece of work, though. So. Uh, here's Titian. And Titian, to me, uh, is probably one of the most underrated or understudied and talked about artists of the Renaissance. Um, you know, he and Raphael, beyond just about any of those artists, if you really wanted to look at, you know, a wide set of skills, uh, you know, Titian definitely had all of the tricks in the book and, and he used them, you know, effectively. Uh, look at the uh, foreshortening and the perspective on the figures, you know, as they move up and above your eye level. You know, it's pretty incredible. Uh, and you have this sense that you really are looking up at them, that they're up above you in heaven. And then, of course, you have man down here, you know, and those are about life-size figures. Uh, then Tell here. us some different stuff, Charles. Pardon? Tell us some different stuff. Some different stuff? Yeah, stuff to, we get this on the regular tour. Tell us about these guys' nightlife. Oh. Do well, they, were they party animals or what? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't really know, to, to be honest with you. I, I didn't know <laughs> with them. I wasn't around then. Anyway, this you is the they could just go to work and then go to bed and then come back to go to work. Well, well, you know, life moved at a little uh, slower pace back then. At any rate, uh, this is the last painting I wanted to talk about. And uh, again, this is another painting by Titian. And uh, if you will, again, notice that far over to our right hand side, uh, there happens to be a female figure in there who happens to be of African descent, right? Now, the story here is about the goddess Diana, uh, who just got, you know, uh, surprised by this young man. Uh, his name was, uh, was it uh, Ante Antion or something like that? Anyway, she, uh, you know, she was naked and taking a bath, and it was kind of a, a, a major no-no to stumble upon someone, see, particularly a goddess, and to see her naked. So for this poor, unfortunate hunter, what she did is she ended up turning him into a deer and then his, uh, his own dogs ended up eating him. <laughs> and that was his punishment for uh, coming upon her and disturbing her while she was taking a bath. You know, not, not a good ending for him, I guess. So anyway, so that's kind of the, the middle Renaissance and uh, so next week, we're going to uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we call the High Renaissance, okay? And so, in between times, uh, Wednesday we're going to be talking about paintings. Send me some stuff in, okay? Friday we're going to be talking about drawings send me some stuff in okay we got 20 we got 20 some odd people here so send me some work okay you know current work would be great you know if you want to send in stuff that you've done in the past you know and uh kind of talk about it critique it whatever that's fine too all right but uh send me some things in i'll gather it up and we'll go from there all right Hey, Charles, Yes. I, I sent you something from my way past. Would you?